Welcome to our service today. We're live. I'm Mike Bloom, Breath of Life Christian Teaching Center, and uh, we're going to have a wonderful time in the Word today. Thanks for joining in. We're live every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., and then Thursday, uh, 7.30 p.m., and Thursdays, we're taking what we've preached on a Sunday like today and discussing it. So we'll be getting into that this weekend, this week as time goes by, and then of course next Sunday. So um, let's get ready for the word of the Lord. I've got a message entitled, uh, Concerning Covenants, Are You More Old Than New? Are you more adapted to the old covenant way of living than the new covenant way of living? And that's kind of plain and evident with people that aren't spirit-filled, for example. I mean, the whole thing about the new covenant is the spirit of God living in us and leading us. But there could be other indications as well that might indicate that, you know, you more lean toward the way Moses and the old covenant people did this. So Brad already on our live stream had mentioned that, uh, thank God for his grace and this is going to be heavy on grace of God because that's the whole difference between the old covenant and the new. It's law versus grace. And you know, Paul the apostle and the rest of the apostles had an unbelievable amount of time they had to deal with people that wouldn't break away from the old covenant law. And that's what a lot of the New Testament's about. Jesus was giving them a transition understanding from his time in ministry on the earth. So uh, let's get ready. We're going to get into this. The problem persists until today and God still needs to speak about it. And we're going to get into what we've discussed about Elisha and Elijah as well and our eyes being open. So Lord bless you as we move into the service and take this time and opportunity to worship God. Hallelujah. Who am I that you'd leave the throne of glory so divine? Then come to my world with a baby's cry. Become a man like me so I could be set free just to satisfy my need, Lord. Above my hurt in 
time for our offering, and if you'd like to give to our ministry and this is a blessing to you, you can do so by e-transfer or PayPal at bolm.portage at gmail.com or paypal.me slash breathoflifechurch. We really appreciate your giving, and it goes toward the work of this ministry. Thanks, and God bless. Amen, amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Perfect songs to lead us into this subject today. And we're getting ready. We're going to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Take from where we left off and go further and get into this issue of testaments. In Acts chapter 9, we find out about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And God's been opening us up so much to revelation and, and, and urging us toward receiving revelation. And Paul, who in Ephesians chapter 1, spoke about the eyes of our understanding uh, having need of being opened and enlightened so we can see this power of the Holy Ghost that we have toward us, how great it really is equal to the power with which he raised up Jesus and put him on the throne, that apostle was actually, I, you could call him an apostle of revelation. And I don't mean the book of revelation, I mean revelation, where ministering, he had received so many revelations, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that God had to send a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he should be exalted above measure, for the abundance of revelations God was giving to him. In fact, you're going to see how revelation was the whole basis of his experience. But let's go again to Acts chapter 9, talking about Saul. And I won't go over every little verse. We've done that in the past. But talking about how he was um, wreaking and making havoc of the churches. And on his way to Damascus, of all places, and that falls into the story of Elisha and his servant in the Syrian army. He went there getting permission to take Christians that were in the synagogues and persecute them to the death. He later describes that in Acts chapter 22. He persecuted people to the death. And he would, whether they were men or women, it didn't matter if even if it was women, he would hail them, drag them to the prisons, and what's interesting is this shows you that the Pharisees had jurisdiction outside of Israel in the synagogues in a country called Syria, whose capital was Damascus. They could even have authority over those believers in Damascus outside of Israel. And so Paul is on his way. And you know the story how he heard a voice as a light shone round about him, throwing him to the ground. And Jesus, you have to understand at this point, is on the throne in glory. He's ascended up into heaven as we've been studying. He's seated on that throne. In fact, in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was being martyred, he actually says that when they were stoning him, he was full of the Holy Ghost. He was looking up into heaven and he literally saw the glory and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He saw Jesus in what Psalm 110 verse 1 prophesied, sitting at that right hand until his enemies would be made his footstool. And he said, I see him. And just like when Jesus was dying, he prayed for these people that God would not lay that sin to their charge. And that's a little bit of a glimpse of New Testament difference from the Old Testament. And I'm really going to weigh in on that. You see, there's a judgmentalism. There's a lack of forgiveness. You will often find with people who aren't people of grace, they're people of legalism. They're very judgmental. Judgmentalism comes from the knowledge of good and evil. And when you focus on what's good and focus on what's evil, you, you have something really that our flesh leans toward. There's a bend in our flesh toward the knowledge of good and evil. And we get it. Because Adam put that miserable stuff in us when he ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That knowledge, that, that 
nature got inside of us. And look at infants. You know there's something wrong with humanity. When an infant who hasn't had a chance to even be exposed to anybody begins leaning toward this self-centeredness and this fleshliness and, and anybody that's raised children, knowing what the Word of God teaches, it just amazes you. I remember when our first child, Brandon, he's watching. <laughs> he was our first child and, and we saw those tendencies there. And you can't say, Brandon, that you had them less than the others. They all had them. And that's just in us. You don't have to teach a child to do wrong, but you're going to have to teach him how to do right. And so it's within us to learn what's right, learn what's wrong, so then we could avoid the wrong and make ourselves do the right. And that's what law is all about. So law really went along with our flesh. But I think God allowed that. He, he brought a law in that focused on the knowledge of good and evil just as much as that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil got infused within our systems and we have that bend toward that direction because he wanted to show us, okay, let's take the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to bring it to a maximum of what is knowledge of good and evil and then you see if you can make yourself avoid the wrong and do the good. And of course, man miserably failed. And Peter even, I believe it's in Acts chapter 10, he says, why, why put a yoke on the Gentiles when even we and our fathers, us Israelites, couldn't even keep the law of Moses? And so it just took advantage of that. And, and, and sin took law like the devil took the knowledge of good and evil in that fruit and killed Eve with it. Sin took the law and killed Paul with it, according to Romans chapter 7. And it all goes back to the knowledge of good and evil. So God wanted man to learn a lesson in a hard way, but really learn it so that when grace would come along, that would all change. But there's a judgmentalism. Adam, as soon as he ate that knowledge of good and evil, God actually it started with the ser uh, with Eve, you know, or he cursed the serpent. And then the woman, when he dealt with her, the serpent. You know, he beguiled me and I did eat. And then God goes to Adam. Well, what about you? He said, well, the woman, which you made God after all, she beguiled me, she led me and I did eat and so forth. And there's this self-preservation. There's this judgment. I mean, they were telling lies. They were telling the truth. They factually told what had actually happened. But you see the impulse behind it. And there's a judgmentalism with people where they tend to look down on others. And in Romans chapter 14, when Paul had to deal with keeping certain days and not keeping other days, and that shouldn't be an issue in the church, like Galatians chapter 4 says, days, months, and years. You know, I'm afraid of you. You're still under the old covenant. And he said, by the way, Galatians, that old covenant was for us Israelites before we came to Christ so that when Christ would come, we would go to him and accept him. Really willingly, because we should have learned the lesson. Man, this stuff, love law, kills you. And that's why Paul even called the law the, the uh, ministration of death, the ministration of condemnation. And, and he was even trying to serve Christ with that law type mentality. And that's the condemnation he was talking about when he said in chapter 8, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. After just saying when he serves God with the flesh, it actually makes him serve sin and death. So... Romans 8 and 1, don't walk after the flesh, walk after the Spirit. And there's the difference between the Old and the New Covenants, a walk after the flesh versus a walk after the Spirit. And a lot of people, especially in mainline denominationalism and any denominationalism that doesn't have Spirit in filling, you're going to see legalism there. And unfortunately, I've even seen legalism over the hilt when it comes to Spirit-filled people who should be the ones above everybody that walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh and fleshly legalism. But at any rate, it's a big battle. And it was in Paul's day. It's still in ours. And so when we go back to Acts chapter 9, here, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus says. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks and, 
And then knowing the only Lord that he ever knew and he ever served was the Jehovah God Almighty of the Old Covenant, he says, well, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now notice what God does here. Paul was very much under the Old Covenant. He was raised up under Gamaliel's teaching, the strictest sect of the Pharisees. He talks about that in Acts 22, just like he does in other places. Uh, in, in Philippians, where he says in chapter 3 that, he said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was the strictest sect of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were strict to begin with, but he was of the strict of the strict. And born of Hebrew parents, Hebrew of Hebrews. And so here, all he knows is legalism. And so when God said, when he says to the Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The Lord doesn't instruct them what to do altogether, except go into the city, go to Damascus, and there it's going to be told to you what you must do. For all he knew, he was going to be laying his head on a chopping block. Somebody there will tell you to put your head on the chair. God didn't say that. Jesus didn't say that. But you've got to have this mindset of the old covenant. Remember they threw that adulterous woman at the feet of Jesus. And do you remember they said, Moses said you should stone her. But what do you say? And he just didn't say anything. And he started writing in the dust. And you heard what I believe about that. He, we're made from the dust of the earth. He's the word of God. He's writing. He's rearranging her DNA, the dust that she was made of, so to speak, and giving her mercy. See, in the Old Testament, you couldn't be born again. You couldn't die with the old man in the body of sins. And you couldn't be freed from serving the law of sin and death. You just had to make it or you would be broken, talking about breaking it, it would be you broken. And then they kept insisting, and he looks up and he says, which of you is without sin? You just go ahead and you cast the first stone. And then he went back down to writing in the dust, and then he heard their shuffling feet, and then he looks up. Not surprisingly, woman, where are your accusers? She says, I have none, Lord. Well, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And Paul the Apostle called the Old Covenant ministry the ministry of death, stoning, the ministry of condemnation. Neither do I condemn thee, Jesus said. And so here you've got a situation where you'd feel like stoning them. And you know, we've all been in situations where we've seen wickedness in the world and we said, I wish stoning was still in effect. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's a part of us that still kind of leans toward the Old Covenant. And this is what we're going to see. So here, Paul is told, Saul of Tarsus at that point, it'll be told you what you need to do when you get there. And, and the people that were there goes on. And then he was blinded. Talk about the light shining and opening Stephen's eyes to see Jesus on the throne. That same Jesus blinded Saul of Tarsus. And like that Syrian army, he was led to Damascus, like the Syrian army was led to Samaria. And he was there three days without sight, and he wasn't eating. Now, why do you suppose for three days he's without sight, and he wouldn't eat, and he wouldn't drink? That guy was praying and fasting. If you realized what you had done against God, and you were persecuting to the death his people, you know, in the book of Acts, later on, you read, you, you overseers of the flock of God, you better be careful with how you treat the church, the apple of his eye. You know, in the Hebrew culture, the apple of your eye is your pupil. And so, in order for something to be described as the apple of one's eye, that's what one's eye is always focused on, the desire, your love. I mean, as much as the pupil is right there, dead center, wherever you look, He's saying that the apple of a person's eye is what they are dead center in the eyes of those, what they want to look at. In other words, their love. And, and so here he's got an old covenant understanding. He knows about stoning. He knows what they did in the Old Testament to wicked people. And so he was praying and fasting, reaching out to God, maybe making life right, maybe repenting like crazy because his life was over. But then... God allowed those three days to pass because there at Damascus was a disciple who was Ananias. And God spoke to Ananias in a vision. And Ananias says, Here am I, Lord. And God says to him, Go into the street called Straight 
and there's a certain man named Judas where another man named Saul is residing. That's the word of knowledge coming forth to this guy. And he is from Tarsus, and he's praying. See, all we read here what that was that he was without sight and didn't eat and didn't drink. And then you tie that together with what Jesus said to Ananias. He's praying. You know that he was praying and fasting. And get this. We pointed this out the other night. I hadn't noticed this before last week. He was blind, couldn't physically see. And Saul of Tarsus is told by Jesus to Ananias that he saw a vision. I mean, he was blind, but yet God gave him a vision. And he saw a man named Ananias. There, Saul of Tarsus isn't even saved yet. And God is giving him a vision while he's blind in a time of praying and fasting. And in this vision, he sees somebody that he knows his name. God supplies him with the name of this person. People have doubts about God showing preachers people's names when preachers are saying, God showed me your name is this and your name is that and this is your address. Well, he gave Ananias the guy's address, a street called Straight in a man named Judas's house. He not only told the name of the owner of the house, he said there's a visitor there named Saul of Tarsus, told him where Saul was from and his address. This is definitely New Testament ministry, folks. You see, that's another thing I want to mention. Old covenant mentality, judgmentalism and legalism is often bereft of the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. And the more a fellowship gets away from the gifts of the Spirit, the less you see the gifts of the Spirit, there's probably a tendency of fleshliness, law, and legalism. And so, he says, I showed Saul in a vision. Talk about having a ministry of revelation later on. He gets so many revelations, Paul the Apostle, that God has to send a messenger of Satan to buffet him so he wouldn't be lifted up in pride. Before he's even saved, he's seeing a man named Ananias in a vision coming to him. And he saw that Ananias would put his hand on him and that would cause Saul to receive his sight. And Ananias hasn't even gone yet. And he says to the Lord, I've heard many things of this man, blah, blah, blah. He talks about all this authority. He, he's going to bind everybody. Lord, your precious name is holy. Jesus, your name is holy. And he's got authority from chief priest to bind everybody that calls on your holy name of Jesus. I don't know if I should go. As if Ananias had to correct God about something. But the Lord said to him, go your way. He's a chosen vessel. He's going to bear my holy name, Jesus. He's going to bear the name of Jesus, Ananias, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I'm going to show him not only that, but for my name, Jesus, my namesake, he's going to suffer great things. It's safe. Go. <laughs> and Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and then he did just what the vision was about. I remember God gave me a dream, and in the dream he told me to call up a preacher in Hamilton, Ontario. I was pastoring in Newfoundland in the early 90s. I got up in the morning, because it was a Saturday night, I had that dream. And I got up Sunday morning, called that preacher, did what I saw in the dream, and then he didn't answer it like he did in the dream, but he got the message, and I found out months later, he had prayed for preachers to call him, somebody to call him. I was one of five preachers who called that day because they were going through I don't even know what he was going through. But just like that, Ananias did exactly what he saw according to the vision that God gave him. And he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, he stresses it again. And this is the thing, this is the thing that impacted Saul of Tarsus so much. The God of the Old Testament that I thought I was serving has been all this time Jesus, a manifestation in the flesh named Jesus. No wonder he said, what do you want me to do? Because evidently, I, I, evidently, beyond doubt, I'm not doing what I should be doing. You're rebuking me for what I'm doing. So will you direct me to do what I should do, God Almighty of the Old Testament, named Jesus? And so he stresses that the Lord, even Jesus, appeared to you in the way as you came. Well, Saul of Tarsus is going to know this guy heard from God as much as he did. And by the way, Saul would have realized, I'm not imagining things. This vision, I mean, he wouldn't have had a vision as a Pharisee. He wouldn't have experienced anything like that. But all of a sudden, he's getting a vision now. Well, really, he's still a Pharisee. 
No wonder he preached Jesus so strongly. No wonder he was as zealous for the kingdom of God as he was for the pharisaical persecution against the church, persecuting people to the death because he had a supernatural experience. This is what concerns me. Folks, we need to pray and pray and pray that when people come into this new covenant understanding and come into our congregations and churches, that God just fill them with the Spirit, give them such an overwhelming supernatural experience that it'll put them on fire for the rest of their lives. I received a supernatural experience. I spoke with other tongues. I hollered out in church and shy old Mike Bloom standing over by the wall in a Wednesday night service, after a Sunday night service after the preaching. We just come up. I had not done that in my life. I, I hardly could raise my hands and worship. I was so self-conscious. Uh, but I burst out in tongues and it felt so good. And I just let it roll and roll and roll. Oh, it felt so good to just holler out in those other tongues. And then I got a call to the ministry. God spoke to me in Isaiah chapter 6. Interestingly enough, the chapter where Isaiah saw in Revelation Jesus sitting on the throne that John chapter 12 refers to in retrospect and, and being told, Isaiah, you go and you preach and you pre and, and that has become so much a part of my ministry. I read Paul. I read his writings. I read his epistles. I fell in love with the Word of God. God started opening things up to me. And and now I'm getting revelations myself, and I couldn't believe it when I started getting them on my own. And I realized how Saul turned into Paul had such powerful revelation. And oh, hallelujah. And those supernatural experiences, folks, put a determination in me and, and broke through something in a flesh barrier that it's just kept me going and going. And I've struggled and I've had hard times but I've never backslidden away from Jesus. I've held on. And that's what really coming into a supernatural experience with Jesus will do for a person. And so if you really want to get on fire for God and you really want to be able to stand in the midst of opposition, no matter what anybody does, seek God, break through that veil of fleshliness and break into a holiest of holies experience of supernatural experiences with Jesus Christ. It'll make it more real than this tangible, touchable world is. Hallelujah. And that's the power of the New Testament differentiating from the old. And so he says, I've been sent, Saul. I've been sent for you to receive your sight and you to get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And boom, immediately as his hands were laid on him and as he was saying these words to Saul, scales physically fell off of Saul's eyes. He received sight. He got baptized, which isn't very popular today anymore. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And he was certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues, the very synagogues where he was supposed to arrest Christians. He started aiding and assisting them and preaching the same message they believed. In other words, he wasn't arresting people and removing them from this way, which he called Christianity. He was promoting it even more in these synagogues where these believers were. And he preached that Jesus is the Son of God. People were amazed that heard him. They said, what a change. Isn't this the guy that destroyed them, which called on his name? And he said he could bring them bound to the chief priests, and he increased more in strength. He confounded the Jews at Damascus. Hallelujah. Proving that this is very Christ. And the Jews couldn't do anything else with him but seek to kill him. They, they couldn't defeat him in his arguments. They couldn't refute his, his sermons and his convicting and confounding messages of Jesus being the Messiah, that all they could do is kill him. Sounds a lot like what happened to Jesus. Amen. And he even had to get down out of the town by a, a, a basket through the window of a wall. And then he came to Jerusalem and everybody was afraid. But what an experience. And you know, in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, when Elisha prayed for those Syrian soldiers to be blinded, they were led to Samaria. But the interesting thing is, when Saul of Tarsus, he was an enemy of God, the Holy Ghost led him to Damascus. Now these soldiers in Samaria were from Damascus. 
They had come from there. The king had sent them. There were bands of Syrians attacking the Israelites. And he commanded these soldiers to get a hold of that Elisha and his servant and get this work of God where he was being shown things. Elisha was by the revelation of God to inform Israel everything the Syrian king was going to do to put an end to it. But it's like the power of God in the New Testament is bolding and more daring than anything in the Old. Hallelujah. Because in the, in the New Testament, Saul of Tarsus was led to Damascus from which the Syrian soldiers were sent in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 6. So he just doesn't go and be, is led by Elisha to Samaria, to the king of Israel, capital of the northern tribes. He was led into the enemy's camp and that's where he gets the Holy Ghost. That's where his eyes are open. And most of all, that's where God didn't kill him. That's where God showed him mercy and the new covenant message of forgiveness of sins through the death of Jesus was directly applied to Saul of Tarsus when Jesus' death became the penalty for his sins. You see, they wanted to stone that adulterous woman in Jesus' day. And, and he brought out that forgiveness. Why would he bring out that? Isn't God concerned with sin anymore? Is it true that this grace is a greasy grace and that sin is tolerated and it's overlooked? Oh no, it's grace that's more powerful than the old covenant could ever be against sin because it demands death, hallelujah, not just of certain kind of sinners. The New Testament demands death of every kind of sinner. Amen. And Jesus' sacrificial death counts as every human being's death. That is necessary for God to deal with sin in this world. In the Old Testament, they had animal sacrifices because even the animal sacrifices death at least was the penalty for everybody in Israel's sins. But there were some cases, uh, there, was, there was adultery, things like homosexuality, there was uh, perversion and, and murder and all these things. The person had to be stoned. But praise God, folks, Jesus Christ's death counts as our death, and it's on the same level for everybody, where they had animal sacrifices for some, but direct stoning and death for others. But Jesus takes all of it. Hallelujah. He takes all of it. Amen. He takes the murderers. He takes the sodomites. He takes the thieves. He takes the adulterers. And he takes it all and puts it on the same level as anybody that's just born in sin as a liar. And in his death becomes the solution for everybody. He puts everything on the same playing level field. And then we see Jesus Christ forgave Saul, even though he was dragging people to their deaths. Now, when you go back to 2 Kings and you go to chapter 6 and you find out where this happened similarly with these soldiers, the bands of Syria, when they came against Elisha, they were led blind into the midst of Samaria. And God opened their eyes when they got there, just like Ananias prayed for Saul and his eyes were open. And the king of Israel said, shall I smite them? There's that old covenant answer. And Elisha reaches out of the old covenant and it's like spiritually he goes into the new and he takes something and he foreshadows what the new covenant was really going to be like when he said, don't smite them, don't kill them. Would you smite those whom thou hast taken captive with your sword and bow? They're already captive. Set bread and water before them. Let them eat and drink and then let them go to their master. That is mercy. And here's where you see Elisha's ministry was more similar to the New Testament than Elijah's. Oh my, it's so important to see that distinction. You know, um, I just want to throw this in also, that when we go back to Acts chapter 9, notice that Jesus, when he appeared to Saul of Tarsus, he asked what he should do. And then he says, let's find it again. It's going to be told you what to do. Jesus himself wouldn't relate the gospel to Saul of Tarsus. Not even Jesus. Ananias ended up doing that. Jesus didn't directly baptize Saul, and he could have. <laughs> he appeared to him. 
But he said, no, there's going to be a preacher. He didn't mention that at the time, but that's what would happen. And so then in chapter 10, you see the same thing happen where a man of an Italian descent, Cornelius, he, he served the God of Israel and he gets a vision like Saul of Tarsus gets a vision. And, and an angel comes to him and names him Cornelius, just like Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he says, I want you. And he gives the address and name and of all of this, just as much as Saul and, and, Ananias, and Ananias did. Go to Joppa, there's somebody called Simon. His, his surname is Peter, and he lodges with one Simon a tanner, just like Saul of Tarsus was in this other man's house on Straight Street. And he says his address, by the way, is by the sea. See all this New Testament gifts of the Spirit happening? And just like Jesus told Saul, he's going to tell you what you ought to do. And Peter comes and preaches the gospel. Folks, a lot of people say, I wish God would just tell me what to do. Are these preachers right or are they wrong? You know, if it's the gospel, how come Jesus himself doesn't send an angel or speak from heaven and tell me the gospel? Folks, we got strict Bible evidence to prove that God has ordained ministers of the gospel in the church to preach the gospel, and an angel isn't going to take their job, and God himself, Jesus, isn't even going to preach. He's going to send people the body of Christ. Hallelujah, God. Now, when we think of all of this, I do want to take you now to Acts 22, because... There, Paul, now Paul the Apostle, is talking and giving his testimony how he was a Jew. He was born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia. And again, he's brought up under the feet of Gamaliel, the perfect man of the law. I mean, Gamaliel, those Pharisee of Pharisees, they completely adhered to the law. They didn't miss any of it. And, uh, and he said, I persecuted these people to the death. There's the words, Acts 22 and 4, that show us that. And the high priest bears me witness who was standing right there that day. My, Paul stood up for the word of God and talked about going to Damascus. And then he says, on my journey, a light shone, I fell to the ground. Same thing Acts chapter 9 recounted when he cried to Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And he talked about the others and he said, go to Damascus, it'll be told what you must do and what's appointed for you. And he said, I couldn't see for the glory of that light. Led by the hand, I came to Damascus, Ananias, and look at this, a devout man according to the law. See, that's what the power of the Holy Ghost does. The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in them who walk after the Spirit. Because in Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says that when you walk after the flesh, you'll sin. But if you walk not after the flesh you'll fulfill the law. And there's no law against the things that the Holy Ghost will cause you and encourage you and motivate you and empower you to do. Hallelujah. You don't walk after the law. You walk after the Spirit. And when you walk after the Spirit, it'll put something in you where you just don't want to murder, let alone you make yourself not murder. You won't want to commit adultery, let alone making yourself not commit it when you really want to. And this guy, according to the law, was devout. He had a good report of all the Jews. And he came and said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. At the same hour I looked on him, and the God of our fathers, he said, so forth and so on. And why are you tearing? Get baptized, calling on the name of Jesus to wash away your sins. Unpopular in churchianity today. And he said, I came and I prayed. And then he said, I went into the temple when I went back to Jerusalem. I got into another trance when I was in the temple. And he's appealing to the temple, to the high priest and all these people, putting him on trial to let him know he doesn't think the temple's nothing. He doesn't disdain all of these things from the old covenant. It's just that covenants have changed. And God, who under the old covenant would have killed this guy, gives him mercy and Stephen, not at all like an old covenant prophet, he prays that God forgives these people and God takes the worst of them all, Saul of Tarsus, whom he foresaw would take people to their deaths because of their faith in Jesus and makes him the apostle, doesn't kill him, 
has him die through Jesus Christ's death, has him baptized into Jesus Christ's death, and then raises him up to walk in newness of life, and he's preaching the gospel hotter and harder than anybody in that day did it. Hallelujah, God. He said, I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on you, Jesus. And he said, I want you to go. They're not going to receive your testimony here in Jerusalem. I know you're standing strong for me. I know you're convincing and you're confounding them. But Saul, now Paul, there's just some people, don't matter how convincing you are with the word, they're going to believe what they want to believe. And, oh, have, have we not found that to be true in how many cases you've ever experienced people sharing the word of God that are caught up in false doctrine. And so, anyway... He says, I'm sending you far to the Gentiles. And one of our watchers sent me a note that mentioned it, discussed it Thursday night. Maybe that's another reason why he had his eyes open in Damascus outside of Israel. Maybe that's another reason Jesus Christ appeared to him outside of Israel and told him not to go to Israel, but to go to Damascus where he was going in a more daring feat than anything under the old covenant would have done and goes right into the enemy's camp, and God fills him with the Holy Ghost just to put it in the face of the devil. Hallelujah. Take a look at this devil. Take a look at this man. And now he's going to work for me, and he's going to fight harder for me than he ever fought for you. That's the power of the New Testament. You see, before we close, I want to show you, and God's got, just got so much I received in my spirit about this issue. But I want to take you to, uh, let me see, 1 Kings, and I believe it's chapter 19. This is when Elijah had Jezebel chasing after him, after he had killed 300 prophets of Baal, called the fire of God down from heaven on the sacrifice, proving when Baal couldn't do anything and send a, a spark down out of glory to strike the pagan worshiping altar. God showed that he's the God of Israel. And Jezebel and Ahab were supposed to be leading Israel, and they weren't serving the God of Abraham whatsoever. They were serving Baal. They were involved in witchcraft. And so she's after Elijah. And then she says, So do to me these gods, and more also, if not, this man's life is like the one of them that were killed, how he slew all the prophets with a sword by this time tomorrow. And he went for his life, came to Beersheba. That belonged to Judah. And he went a day's journey. And then he prays and, God, kill me. Get me out of this. And he's so angry at Israel, going under false prophets, scared for his life, and, and, and thinking he's the only one that's standing up for them all. And then he's given cake and cruise of water. He gets strength. And where does he go? For 40 days and 40 nights, he's not eating, just like Moses on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights didn't have any food or drink. And he goes. He went for 40 days eating nothing unto Horeb, the Mount of God. He went right to Mount Sinai, just where that very law that gives that knowledge of good and evil was first given to begin with. Right the same mountain of God in Mount Horeb, Sinai. And he goes into a cave and he lodges there. And then the word of God came to him just like it did to Moses on that same mountain. What are you here for, Elijah? And he said, I've been jealous for the children of Israel forsaking your covenant. I wanted you to destroy them. They've slain your prophets, God, and I'm the only one left and they take my life away. He wanted God to thunder and quake and throw lightning on them. And he said, get out of that cave and stand before me. Now, You've got to understand the way this old covenant prophet named Elijah thought. I'm at the Mount Sinai. I'm where the law came. I think that's why he went to that mountain. Where's the judgment of the law? God, you need to kill this woman. You need to kill her husband. I'd personally like to call that fire down that I called on the altar on her head. I'm going to the mountain where Moses got the law. I'm going to the mountain where that thunder, earthquaking, fiery, wind-filled law came. And so God appeared to Moses on that mountain. And you know what? God appears to Elijah on the same mountain. And he says, Behold, the Lord passed by. A great and strong wind 
rents the mountains and breaks it. Wind, I mean, that had to be strong wind. It broke, that wind broke rocks before the presence of the Lord. The Lord wasn't in the wind, though, like he was with Moses on Mount Sinai when he gave the law. And after the wind, there came an earthquake, and God wasn't even in the earthquake, as God was in the days of Moses on Mount Sinai. I'm going to show you that. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. God had fire at that mountain till it burnt like a smoking furnace and burned everything before it when Moses had God appear to him. But God's appearing to Elijah on the same mountain and isn't doing these things. But a still, small voice. The Hebrew actually says a melodious voice, almost as if it were singing. A quiet, soft, comforting voice. Not like the fire, the wind, and the earthquakes. Grace is being uttered by the mouth of God. Not wrath, judgment, and law, but grace. Just like Saul of Tarsus, he's brought to a God who's manifest in the flesh named Jesus, who's filled with grace. Hallelujah. Moses brought the law, but Jesus brings grace and truth. Hallelujah, God. And it was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. He takes this sign of a prophet and wraps his face in it. This is what makes me a prophet, and he goes out before God. You see, God spoke to Ezekiel out of a whirlwind in Ezekiel 1. Amen. He even spoke to uh, Job out of the whirlwind. But God wasn't in the wind here. All these things. And then you read, when Elijah goes out, he stands and a voice comes. And what are you doing here? And he repeats the whole thing all over again. And he said, go. Return, get on your way. I want you to anoint three people. Hazael, I want you to anoint him to be king over Syria. Jehu, I want you to anoint him to be king over Israel. And Elisha, I want you to anoint him to be prophet in your room instead of you. And you know what? I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to deal with sin. Him that escapes from the sword of Hazael, whom you're going to anoint, Jehu, whom you're going to anoint, is going to slay. And him that escapes from the sword of Jehu and Hazael, Elisha's going to slay. And by the way, I got 7,000 people that never bowed their knee to me, Elijah. You're not the only one. And so he departed. And then Elijah goes to Elisha and throws his mantle on him. And it's not long after that, that this old covenant-ridden prophet that wanted to see the thunder come down on Israel, that wanted to see the wind crack and break the rock of not just every uh, Mount Sinai rock, but every rock in the entire nation for the wickedness that was going on. And the quake shaped them to pieces. Here's that still small voice instead. And he is taken up into heaven. And just like Jesus gone up into heaven, the mantle fell on the church. And the Holy Ghost moving. It's like Elisha represents the new covenant people. And Elisha, immediately after that, he goes to the Jordan. Amen. The Jordan that he split open, like Elijah split it open. But here he's working with a whole bunch of Bible school students or sons of the prophets. And they're building a Bible school on the banks of Jordan. And, and he's going to teach them. Hallelujah. You don't see that with Elijah. He seems to be on his own. And there were sons of the prophets, probably some of his students. But the fact is that the focus was more on the whole group of them with Elisha. And you only see a vague reference to it with Elijah. But the whole body is there. It's emphasized. One student is told, hey, you need to see the work of God. Take a stick and throw it in the water where you just lost that axe head that you borrowed from somebody. And that student starts seeing the miracles of God and the axe head swimming. Hallelujah. And, and it reminds you of repentance and forgiveness because John the Baptist was baptizing people in the same Jordan. And just like those Bible school students were being led by Elisha to chop down trees at the Jordan River, John the Baptist said to these Pharisees and Sadducees that came, who hath warned you of the hellfire wrath to come? He said, the axe is laid to the root of the tree and is cut down. 
and axes at the Jordan, cutting down trees, is a message of repentance to John the Baptist. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, you can repent. You can be changed. Your life can turn around until God doesn't have to kill you, but he takes a turned around repentant life. He puts it into the death of Jesus Christ by baptism in water in Jesus' name and causes Christ's death to count as that sinner's death. And that's the judgment that the sinner takes. That's the judgment that Saul of Tarsus took for all of his sin, killing Christians to the death, hailing them to the prisons. He died all right. He's praying, fasting, worried about he's going to die. Well, by the time he got done praying and fasting, worrying about his death, hallelujah, he did die, but he died through the grace of Jesus Christ by having Jesus Christ's death count as his. One man said to me once, you don't know what I've done. I've done some really bad things. I said, God knows what you've done. And he's saying the same thing to you that he's saying to everybody. You can have the death of Jesus count as your death. And Jesus' death was punishment on a human being, on a human life, for any sin anybody might ever commit. The death and the suffering of Jesus where he was marred more than any man takes care of all the wrath that God has against any sin you can imagine. Hallelujah. The new covenant. That's why, folks, people that want the quaking. Oh, look at this. I need to show you. we got a little bit left here. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, look down in verse... 17. Let's look at the beginning. God brought Israel out of the land of Egypt. They're at Mount Sinai now. And down in verse 17, look what we see at Sinai. The very things that he saw, Elijah saw at Mount Sinai. After God gives the Ten Commandments, with the last few being, don't covet your neighbor's house, don't covet your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, nor his ox, ass, anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings. They saw the lightnings, the noise of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. There you got the fire. You got the quaking. And the people saw it. They removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, speak with us and we'll hear. But please don't let God speak to us anymore. We're going to die. And Moses said, fear not. God's come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. You see, that's how God dealt with sin in the Old Testament. He put the fear of God in people. He terrified them out of their wits so that they wouldn't sin. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And you know, that all happened, interestingly enough, on a third day. Oh, I'm going to show you in closing the difference between an Old Covenant third day and the new covenant third day. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day, in other words, three months to the day that Israel came out of Egypt, they arrive at the wilderness of Sinai. Think of that. Three months to the day they arrive at Mount Sinai. They had departed from Rephidim, but they'd come to the desert of Sinai and pitched in the wilderness and Israel camped before that mountain. There's the mountain Elijah ascended. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him. Now remember, this is the same day. Hallelujah. Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, Tell Israel, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. I brought you to myself with eagle's wings. You see that in Revelation, the woman giving wings as an eagle and coming. To the wilderness. Now, if you'll obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, you're going to be a peculiar treasure to me. Peter, by the way, applies that to the New Testament church in his epistles. You're a peculiar people. You're a peculiar treasure. You'll be a kingdom of priests and holy nation. Kingdom, kings and priests. Just like Peter said, we're kings and priests. Just like Paul, or rather John in Revelation said, we're kings and priests. And Moses came and he called them and they said, we'll do it. We'll obey him. We'll do all these things, God. And then we read down in verse 15. And he said, be ready against the third day, Moses. And Moses told this to the people, be ready against the third day. They arrived in Sinai three months to the day. 
when they left Egypt. And then he's saying, on the third day, you get ready. He said, during these three days, you're not going to come to your wives. And on that third day, it arrived. There were thunders. There were lightnings. There was a thick cloud on the mountain. And there was all of this. The people trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And Sinai was on a smoke because God came in a fire, just like Elijah saw the fire. And the smoke ascended and and look, the whole mountain quaked, just like there was an earthquake with Elijah saw. And we read about the wind. And God started speaking. His voice was waxing louder and long and louder and louder. And God came down on Mount Sinai. The Lord God called Moses to the top. And that's the setting of the third day of the law. But folks... The third day when New Covenant third day significance came into being. And I'm feeling the Holy Ghost as I say it. Jesus Christ died, not the people. The wrath of God fell on Jesus the first day, not the people. And he was buried and on the third day he resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah. And his death had been ratified as counting as our death when he ascended up into heaven and sat on that throne and made atonement as a high priest and sat down as a king. King of kings and high priest. And his death became ours. And the still small voice of the gospel goes forth. A a voice that's melodic. A voice that's filled with grace and truth. It's not just greasy grace. It's grace and truth. Greasy grace, folks, has no truth. And it preaches repentance. And the blood of Aaron that cried out for vengeance so that Cain might be of judged because of murdering his brother Abel. Hebrews chapter 12 says, the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel. It speaks forgiveness, even to the point that when somebody is killing a Christian named Stephen, he's acting just like Jesus and asking forgiveness for the people killing him. Like Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And it was on the third day where Saul probably figured he was going to die Ananias is going to come. And Ananias comes, and on the third day, it's not the wind and the fire and the earthquake. It's a word of God from Ananias that Saul of Tarsus, you're going to go before kings. You're going to go before the children of Israel, and you're going to go before Gentiles, and you're going to take a different testament. You're taking a different covenant than what you're used to, and you're going to bring it out there. Hallelujah. And you are going to preach such grace that people under legalism will never get it straight. They'll think you're condemning Moses' law. They'll think you're preaching breaking the law. There'll even be preachers 2,000 years from now that are thinking that Jesus never would have condoned. I never would have condoned, Jesus said, your ministry. But you are being led by my spirit and they just don't understand grace. And you know, today, you can tell if you're more old covenant than new in the way you react when you see sin. Do you want to see judgment come down and people stoned? You know, like I said, we've all probably made those remarks. We ought to thank God Moses' law is in effect anymore for what's happening in our nations. They would have been killed. But folks, that's not new covenant. They are killed under the new covenant in Jesus Christ's death. They're made new creatures, and I don't care what you did. God can see that old you killed through the death of Jesus. And you're forgiven. God forgets what you did because if God makes you a new creature and the old creaturehood is destroyed as far as God's concerned, hallelujah, then why even remember what you used to do? And you know what? If we're more old covenant than new, here's one of the symptoms that reveal that. It still bothers us what we used to do before we were saved because we're not aligning ourselves up with the new covenant way of thinking. And if your old covenant more than you are new, you just might be like the Corinthians. And the Corinthians, Paul had to talk about favoring one preacher over another. He had to talk about taking each other to courts. He had to talk about fornication and illicit physical relationships. He had to talk about outward things all the time. He had to talk to them about uh, hair 
and, and preach on hair all the time. He had to talk about veils and covering your head all the time. He had to talk about men all the time, just keep your hair short. And he had to talk about outward things like that and communion. You know, stop fussing with one another. You shouldn't be having communion if you're going to fuss with one another the way you are. And, and he had to talk about things like that to a people whom he referred to as the Corinthians who were so immature, he had to give them milk and not meat of the word. But when you get into people that can eat the meat like the Ephesians, you read about Jesus talking about opening their eyes through this Apostle Paul, giving them revelation that the Holy Ghost power toward them can conquer their fleshliness and all their attitudes and all the ministry and uh, or rather the faulted ministry that the Corinthians had where they spoke in tongues so much out loud that people were flipping out over it in their services if they were unbelievers. He had to correct them and all those things to the Corinthians, but the Ephesians he taught about getting revelation, opening your eyes, walking in the victory wherewith they're called. They're dead with Christ. They got all blessings in spiritual places. Now they need to walk. Paul couldn't talk like that to the Corinthians. They were still in need of outward, carnal, physical things. And what's Christianity mean to you? Issues that are outward? What do you look like? What do you dress? How do you do your hair? You know, how do you wear your clothes? And what places do you go to? And, and go in courts and fussing and fighting and all of these. He dealt with carnal Corinthians about those things. You just might be old, more old covenant than new if those things are on top of your mind more than being led by the Spirit, more than forgiveness. Uh, having other people's faults bother you so much, like the Corinthians, you fuss and fight with each other. Like the Old Testament wilderness walkers through the Exodus, they got fussing so much with each other, and they doubted God could bring them into the land of Canaan and use the supernatural power of God through them, that God had to let the whole generation die. That old generation represents old covenant legalism, and that younger generation represents new covenant led by the Holy Ghost. Ark of the Covenant leading them into through the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, conquering seven kingdoms of the enemy. New Testament life. Hallelujah, Jesus. Elijah, you want me to crack that nation, don't you? Oh, yes, God. I want the thunder to come down. I want the lightning to roar. Amen. The flash and I want the wind to just crack and break. I don't know about you, Lord. You might be in the still, small voice, but I'm not in it. God says, but I am. I want you to go and anoint Elisha in your place now. Who am I that you'd leave the throne of glory so To my world with a baby's cry Become a man like me So I could be set free Just to satisfy my need, Lord Who am I? Who am I? That you cared so much for me Love 
Help me. Mm-hmm. 